for lunch, uh, we have a working panel presented by Cooley, and they are going to talk about uh, practical issues facing IP attorneys in this space, which is actually pretty exciting, uh, considering what's going on, all the uncertainty that I think was touched upon in the first, uh, the first panel. So I'd like to thank them for uh, coming today and, and speaking, and I'll let you take it from here. Thank you. So uh, my name is Wayne Stacy, and this is uh, one of my partners, Sarah Gusky. Uh, we're both primarily patent litigators. Uh, we've taught copyright and patent law at the University of Colorado through the years. Um, and unlike what you saw before in the previous panel, where there was a lot of I guess, expectations and a lot of uh, wonderful ideas about what could take place in the future. We're in the trenches and see the sausage making on a, on a daily basis. <laughs> and sometimes it's, well, one thing about the sausage making that you always see is that it's limited in the damage that it can do. And what we want to talk about here is that some of the, the articles, some of the things we've read that we, we see people are really afraid of patent law negatively, I guess, crushing the 3D printing industry, we really haven't seen either from the, the patent side, we haven't seen it from the investor side. Uh, we just don't see it as quite as dramatic as, as some of the, the writers out there would, would lay it out. And to really go through this, uh, first thing to think about is 3D printing is not new. We've seen very, I mean, actual 3D printing you've seen for, for decades. And then variations on it from uh, semiconductor manufacturing, all the way through the music industry, really set a framework for most of the typical, I guess, 90% of the law that we're going to see uh, affecting companies and emerging companies. So when you, when you step back and think about what we've seen through the years, one of the first regimes that we, we see is the music industry, not the modern music industry, but the old music industry. Now, I'm going to date myself. How many remember the dual cassette players where you could copy one cassette to the other? <laughs> well, that's, I'm, I'm impressed that many people will be willing to admit that. Uh, now, the question is, how many of you still have one? Uh, it is, that's a perfect thing to think about. That's really what were the beginnings of this regulatory, I guess not regulatory, but litigation regime is in the copying of music from those days. And then... For those of you that wonder what a cassette player is and why anybody would have two reel-to-reel -reel machines next to each other, uh, you might have seen the DVD copying machines and read about the fight that Europe had on how to tax those uh, for copyright holders. But So when you look at that entire framework, there's a really nice way to understand how the next 10 years will be, I guess, how it will impact all of the emerging companies in this space, at least on the consumer side. And that's the key distinction I want to make as we start from the panel this morning. This is really a tale of two different types of companies. You've got the industrial 3D uh, printer companies and like the panel we saw this morning, and then you've got the consumer side. And you cannot confuse those two. The consumer side is over there. It's something you can buy, you can afford. It's something that's going to be possible for, for children to use within the next couple of years in most households. What we saw this morning about biologics, I very, very much doubt that you'll ever see one of those in your house. And so the bulk of the commercial activity is going to come around the consumer side, which means that's going to be the bulk of the investment money uh, and the bulk of the litigation. And that's, that's what we're seeing. Not to minimize the, the legal troubles that the industrial side will see, but they're going to be more standard legal troubles on the IP side. And those really will be, I think, follow, if you remember the old a, uh, AMD Intel wars over microchips. That's going to be big company versus big company. Uh, but when you get down to the consumer side, what does the, what does the market look like going forward? And we start with the music in terms of I create files, I need to protect my files, or I'm the file aggregator. And this is probably one of the places you'll see the most creative uh, lawyering, is I am the person that is running a Napster for 3D printer files. And I let you print a Spider-Man. So uh, last night I, I spent, unfortunately, too much time putting together a Lego Batmobile. 
for my son. It wasn't uh, for his son. Yeah, not, okay. <laughs> Maybe for me. A <laughs> little bit for everybody. But if you look at that, Legos themselves, 3D printable easily. But what about the file for the entire Lego Batmobile? Well, now you're going to trigger copyright. You're going to trigger trademark. It's not the patent regime that's going to control that. It's going to be these other standard regimes. And where am I going to get that file? Well, maybe Lego sells it, or maybe I find it on Pirate Bay. Uh, and that's how we have to think about going forward. And what we see in advising our clients they're looking for an outlet, a place to sell their 3D printers. Well, what they need is their own file store. How do you regulate? How do you deal with those kinds of things? Um, in terms of investors, investors are seeing the same type of issues pop up that they saw in Napster. Uh, if you remember in the, the Napster and Grokster world, the investors themselves got sued uh, for contributory copyright infringement. So there's a little bit of hesitation to get involved in the file sharing or the file space for 3D printers as that comes up online. So with that kind of background, what we'd like to do is, is walk through the different regimes that will be out there and talk about where we see them now, where we see them in, in five years, and kind of where we see them in 10 years um, that kind of make up the investment line. All right. so. As Wayne said, uh, the, the patent infringement world, at least currently and, and for the foreseeable future on the consumer side, you've got three major players and three major, uh, I guess, areas for vulnerability for a patent attack, and that's the manufacturers and sellers of the 3D printer, the, the CAD file folks, uh, particularly these sorts of aggregators, the, the uh, app stores of the 3D printer file world, um, and then the end users. And just like with all the other areas of patent law, you've got your, your basic direct and indirect infringement. And you'll see as we go forward that the, the indirect infringement is probably going to be the, the hot area. That's where the money ultimately is right now. And money drives litigation in the patent world in case anyone hasn't uh, <laughs> figured that out yet. So the 3D printers, uh, printer makers right now kind of have it, uh, have it made a little bit when it comes to, uh, to terms of the end product. 3D printers have lots of different uses other than infringement, so they become a harder target for patent cases. Now, as we saw from the panel this morning, as different sorts of techniques for printing, different materials, that sort of thing go forward. Those in the competitor versus competitor world, the printer manufacturers face a, a more real and present danger on the patent infringement side for direct infringement and indirect infringement. Uh, the suppliers and of the CAD files, that's what we're seeing right now. I, there's been lots of press lately about uh, uh, suits and threatened suits for the, these aggregators that are providing the files uh, or making them available that will ultimately produce a patented article. Uh, and then, of course, you've got the users who proving direct infringement's going to be pretty easy, but at what cost? And it's not usually in a patent holder's best interest to go and, and sue each individual. Uh, we, we saw that a little bit in the music world and copyright, and we'll talk about that a little bit as well. So indirect infringement, liability, already touched it, but... Uh, Hang on, how, how many yeah. of you have experience with patent law? Okay. Okay, so let me, let me back up. Back so up. the direct, direct liability is I make, use, sell the actual device uh, that's infringing. So in that instance, I, I'm the actor. Indirect infringement is more of a, a liability shifting. I have caused you to infringe. I sold you the printer, and then I sold you the file to make this infringing object. You enabled it. I, I, it, I not only enabled it, but I actively induced it. I encouraged you to do it. In, in that instance, uh, again, it's like a, there's a liability shifting. You did it, but I have to pay for it if you, you meet the, the proper statutory uh, obligations. And so with the direct infringement, if you're talking about printing 
a, an infringing object. A, a printer is no different than a coffee machine. Um, if, if I go and use a coffee machine to print out a book, well, that's not Xerox's fault or Canon's fault. They, that's my choice. I did that. But if they sold me the machine and then told me, here's how you make duplicates of all these copyrighted works, well, now they have induced me to do, do something wrong and the liability shifts back to them. So most printer manufacturers, if they're going to be liable for direct infringement, it's going to be because of their printer, that they've, their printer design, not because of how the end user is utilizing it. The exception to that is these print manufacturers, printer manufacturers need a market. And they need a market in a bad way. Because the general public doesn't understand, well, what can we do with those yet? Well, a natural, natural place for that would be printing. I go back to Legos. You'll find much of my life revolves around Legos. Uh, so, you know, if I can print, make a Lego printer and print all of the Lego items at my house, uh, well, that might be a market. So we see some printer manufacturers having to be careful about who they partner with. You don't want to partner with someone that calls themselves Pirate Bay, for example, on the files, because that would pull the print manufacturers into the indirect infringement world. So that pretty much brings us to the, the typical state of patent litigation, which is the, the basic concepts of direct infringement, indirect infringement, as it relates to utility patents. And that's what most people think of when they think of patents. It's, it's the, the utility side of things, the functional purpose of, of these devices, but, or the end products. But with the 3D printing world, where I think there's likely to be an uptick in litigation activity, is with the design patents. And it, it's something that I know no one really talked about when I was in law school and patent law was all about the utility uh, patent side of the world. Design patents were kind of the redheaded stepchild um, in, in the patent field. Uh, but you're seeing more and more of that just in, in other areas of patent law as well. The, the Apple Samsung case that, um, if anyone's uh, been alive and breathing for the last few years, I'm sure you've heard a lot about, some of those patents are design patents on the phones. So there, there's definitely a value in those. And you, you think of how that translates to the 3D printer world, you think, well, OK, these 3D printers are creating something that, sure, it may have a functional purpose too, but it may actually, in the end, be the shape, the end product, how it, the, the ornamental aspects of the, fun, the underlying functional product. So I think design patents are definitely going to be something that people think about in terms of their patenting strategy as well to protect against the I guess the proliferation of infringing products that the 3D printers can provide. Uh, and but as of, as of today, you know, in all of our counseling, we haven't seen the design patent come up because the 3D printers that most people have you know, aren't really capable of putting out anything that would be a, a copy of a particular piece of jewelry. Uh, you know, they, they have their limitations. And with those limita short-term limitations, that causes causes some difficulty um, in really seeing any any legislative or I guess any legislative fix or any need for for litigation plus you know design patents have you know, been like Sarah said the backwater for some time people have preferred to use other methods to to really attack counterfeit goods and that's really what you're you're thinking about here it's counterfeit goods uh, that's the legal issue uh, instead of importing from offshore a container full of counterfeit paper, you know, counterfeit objects, it enables every person to theoretically make their own counterfeit object at their home. And so that's, if you think about it from a, a litigation regime, that's where it's gonna shift a little bit. Uh, oh, we don't mind. Yeah, it, it makes it more interesting if it's not just us talking the entire time. So that, I'm, one question I have is whether you need the microphone for the, the webcast. Is this on? Yep. Uh, the file that is input to the printer is its instructions on how to print out the object. 
will that be protected under patent law as a design or under copyright as a piece of software? So you gave me an either or choice. I may go with a, I may go with a third choice and uh, very likely neither. And so one of the interesting issues on, on the 3D print file is if I use a, a 3D scanner and I scan, you, know, you, you pick your object, I scan this object and I get a perfect replica of this in digital code, is that even copyrightable? Is there any original expression in it? Uh, it may bring back some of the more arcane uh, copyright laws back to the, the days of the, the Feist Yellow Pages cases, uh, whether that's even protectable at all. Uh, but then, let's say you do make some modifications and enhancements to it, uh, would it be then patentable? No, because you're changing the aesthetics of it. Um, design patent, possibly, depending on how much what you're really changing, uh, if you're changing enough to you know, change the aesthetics some, I guess, maybe, you'll be in the copyright realm. And but that'll be your only real protection probably is copyright if you're you know, working with this object. If you're creating your own, it would be similar to creating your own sculpture or your own painting. And in terms of the CAD file itself, that, that's not something that is, you could not get a design patent on the file itself. Design patents cover that end product, uh, not, not how it gets there. If you see a design patent, they're pretty simple. They consist of the figures, and the figures are uh, basically the substitute for the claims that are in the utility patents. So instead of the uh, difficult legalese that you have to struggle through in a utility patent to understand what the claims cover, a design patent, it's a picture. So the, the file itself would be out of that realm. Now, uh, I guess one could theorize that there's ways to create a CAD file that, it, it, assuming that software patents remain patentable, that would, would come under a, a utility patent. But the, yeah, yeah, likely. Yeah, you would have to have some sort of. But the most common place you'll see this, I think, is in original works. So what if it changes some of the, the artistic world and I create my statue, then I'd put my 3D scan in it, and then I sell the, the CAD file out so people can print this at their house. You know, I, I specifically designed a, an artistic object for a 3D printer. And in that case, you know, the existing regimes do a, a pretty effective job of, of protecting that. You know, the original sculpture would be protected, the file itself would, would likely be protectable, what you have then is back to the counterfeit or the, the copy issues. Uh, once that, I think it was said several times this morning, once that digital file's out there, it can be replicated, passed around, and you have to have the controls around it. Um, and that's kind of, we'll talk about that in a minute. If you are the file aggregator, if you're the one running the CAD file store, like an app store, um, you're gonna have some obligations to, to control copyright, just like the music stores did. So we talked about the design patents, which are one of the, well, I don't know, he called it backwater, I called it the redheaded stepchild, but there's another area of patent law that is kind of a, a micro issue, at least historically, and that's the repair doctrine. And if, it, if they're the students are in the <laughs> room right now and they've had to struggle through the repair doctrine and the kind of ridiculous sorts of results that can come out of some of those cases, you know that this is, may, maybe the, the 3D printing role will help clear that up. And uh, the repair doctrine, it's a lot of words up here, but basically it's coming up with a distinction between are you making replacement parts or rehabilitating a patented article, and what point do you cross the line where you're now creating a whole new patented article? So the, one of the more recent, uh, recent-ish cases that deals with this, deals with the old disposable cameras, uh, so I guess we could probably do a show of hands about who remembers actual film cameras, but the disposable <laughs> cameras, uh, you know, what, the way that they work is the, you send them in, they rip them open, and they pull the film out, well, what do you do, what do, what do you do with all that packaging? There was a market opportunity there, and what folks were doing is shipping them overseas to a facility that would 
put new film in, keep as many parts as they could and, and repackage it and then resell it usually overseas uh, because there's not a lot of United States consumers that were wanting to buy those things. But it, it became an issue of, okay, at what point uh, in this, I mean, you, you've torn the camera apart, you've replaced the film, you've done all of these things, that's got to be a new patented article so you could have infringe up another finding of infringement on that re repaired camera. Well, the court said no. Uh, and it, it, a variety of reasons, but mostly it was evaluation around, okay, what was actually patented? Was that piece replaced? How many parts compared to the whole thing were replaced? It's that sort of, I guess, nebulous analysis that's on a case-by-case -case basis. But you can see how the 3D printer world could cause an, uh, an ups a surge in these sorts of cases because, okay, so you let's say you buy a pair of noise-canceling headphones that are patented with a utility patent and the headband part breaks. You use a 3D printer to create a replacement headband. Depending on what the patent covers, is that, uh, is that a repair or is that a new potentially infringing article that somebody's owed a license fee on? And one of the issues that will come out of that, again, is who do you sue? I mean, patent litigation is so expensive. The, the printer manufacturer, probably not. They just make a printer that people can use. Uh, are you going to sue individuals? Well, for most things, no. I mean, that hasn't been a perfect strategy for the music industry. But at least there, they had massive numbers of people downloading the same song and doing the same thing. In the patent industry, it's going to be a lot more specific. So how many people are going to need this particular piece reconstructed? So now you're, you're two levels deep. Uh, I, first, I've got to determine whether it's actually a repair or a reconstruction. And you've got to ask yourself, that's the first question that the law puts out there. Is it a repair or a reconstruction? I've been doing this a lot of years, and I still do not know the differences between those two concepts. And I have yet to meet a federal judge that can articulate it either. Um, it's, it's a mess. So you've got a, a messy piece of law there, and then you've got a low-dollar individual to sue. So that rolls it back up every time to the people providing the files. And so in that case, you know, who's providing the repair file? Right, which we'll skip forward there. He jumped ahead, but that's, that's cool. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, as Wayne just said, it comes down to, okay, well, who, who bears the risk then based on a, who's the likeliest target? The end users, there's challenges both under the repair doctrine, design patents, utility patents, it, it doesn't matter. There's challenges with going after the end users. So it's those print file providers where you get the biggest bang for your buck. So it's those folks that are thinking, ah, I can be the iTunes of 3D printer worlds that are gonna need to stop and think, okay, what sort of liability do I have in the patent world, and then what are my obligations to police that? And part of the, the shift in the market you may see is something just like what the, the music industry did. They went from fighting the digital world to joining uh, iTunes, for example, and it's really shifted some of the, the fight on, on piracy. So if you're the actual manufacturer of consumer good that has a component that's going to break, so for the headphones, 3D printers are not useful for the electronics, but they could be useful for the clips. Uh, that's the, the constant thing that I lose from running is the clip that keeps the, the cable from hitting me in the face when I, when I run. So if, you know, should, should Beats be selling those particular things? Uh, if you've got a 3D printer, you can print your own replacement parts. And with that, what do they need to start thinking about to keep other people from offering that? So do you need a little bit of an artistic design in something, put a, the copyright protection around your individual repairable components, at least the visible comparable components? So with that, I think you, what we're seeing is that patents are not exactly a, a comprehensive coverage uh, of what potential rights somebody may have in, as a result of the 3D printer world. So we have to look to the other types of IP protection, including copyright. That's 
probably the most analogous right now uh, to the 3D printer world and the, the hotly contested issues is on the copyright side. So I get to ask the, the next offensive okay. question. How many, so we, we went <laughs> yeah. through cassette tapes. Uh, cassette how many of you have actually ever watched a movie on Betamax? <laughs> how many of you have seen Betamax? <laughs> and how many of you absent law school have ever heard of Betamax? <laughs> It's the same group of people over and wow. over again. It's, it's a certain demographic. <laughs> well, so if you remember this, Betamax was the original VCR, uh, the format that came from Sony. And at that point in time, the content industry, it's, it's amazing they didn't really mature that much in some of their views on technology for 20 years. But the fight was, we want to stop VCRs and Betamax was the technology at that time, that the very existence of the personal video recorder threatened their time slots, threatened their advertising revenue. Uh, you can basically read the same briefs when you see any of the TiVo fights today. Um, same, same basic arguments, but those that were providing the technology, uh, even though they had non-infringing uses, uh, were really should be liable for the infringement. After all, if you don't have a VCR, no one can make a copy. If you don't allow anybody to make the digital printer, no one can knock off trademarked copyrighted goods. So Sony was really, from what our panel was talking this morning, um, the opposite of the light regulation they were looking at to let the industry flourish. Um, if Sony had gone the other way, uh, I'm pretty sure our world would be very, very different in terms of viewing music or viewing video and viewing music. The good thing is this sets the precedent for what we do with 3D printers. Right, and, and Universal, the, the copyright holder in this case, they, they did what is a logical thing to do is when you're looking for people to sue, which is you go for the deep pockets and they're like, oh, well, the people selling the Betamax machines, if we can shut them down, one, it's more money in our pocket potentially, but two, that you do cut it off at the source, so it seems like a logical choice, but I, you could think of, just like with 3D printers, there's lots of non-infringing uses, so you have a major proof problem, and, and that's ultimately the way the, the Sony case came out, so you tie that over to the, the printer manufacturers now, is that in terms of copyright, unless it's a, a printer that's tooled for a certain purpose, and that certain purpose happens to create or infringe somebody's copyright, you're going to have the same protections you would under the, uh, the old Sony doctrine. You contrast that with the, uh, the mu fast forward 20 years to the, the digital music world, as Wayne talked about, and you have the whole Napster line of cases, and, and Grokster too is another big one, uh, where lessons learned by the copyright holders from Sony. They're like, all right, who's next in line? And they, they found the right group. They were able to sue the company that was providing the peer-to-peer -peer services and extract a lot of money and, and shut, shut it down as well. And the file aggregators now for the 3D printers stand the same risks. And, and if, for those of you that haven't seen the, the full scope of this case, Napster got the, the most of the publicity, but in the background, also sued were the major investors. And you know that, that shook up a, a lot of folks in the Valley um, because all of a sudden an investor could potentially have, in, I don't think that these they were just investors like you bought three shares. These were major investors with controlling seats on the board. But it really shook the VC world a little bit about, well, what can we do in, without getting in trouble? And you'll see some of that underlying current uh, pop up, I think, is the uh, aggregators in the, the 3D world advance. And then the, the copyright world, the, the last lesson learned from the Napster era was the individual actions against users. Uh, you could argue all day long that maybe some of those the, both the criminal actions and the copyright actions against the individual Napster users may have had a chilling effect on the copyright infringement. Um, but in general, it, it becomes a burdensome process to go after the users. So again, 
a few parallels exactly to the three D printer world where sure if you came after the the home user that has a printer that printed out a single um or maybe printed out the the Lego blocks necessary to make a copyrighted uh Batmobile. That's it's a way to do it, but it's gonna take you a while to make any real traction uh, on that side and uh you just potentially have yourself a PR nightmare at that point too if you're also in the industry and you're starting to see your customer base. Um that's something you're gonna want to take into account. And the, the question has arisen with several clients about public education. That if you go back to the early 90s, the music copying <laughs> didn't really have a bad bad name. And maybe this is the music industry pushing this out there, but filing all those suits helped most people understand that a copyright violation was actually theft from the actual authors and the actual uh, content providers. There is some underlying question about when 3D printers become more mainstream and a typical household can have one, how will people perceive them? Will they say that it's okay for me to print out my Mickey Mouse figure uh, without paying any royalty to Disney? Uh, will there be an education campaign that's needed on that front? And it's interesting that that discussion's happening now, and I think it's because of the the backlash and the expense that the music industry saw on its side, but I don't think I don't think anyone knows because as one of our panelists or uh, a moderator was mentioning that he tried to explain the, the the technology. Most people don't yet quite understand 3D printing until they they see one of these, and few people have yet seen the the commercial benefits or the home use benefits of a 3D printer. So, in the copyright world, it seems to be where potentially the most liability exists, at least right now. What can you do as a potential infringer if you're the printer, manufacturer, seller, the CAD file distributor, or even uh, as these things pop up, the Kinkos for 3D printing? What can you do to try to protect yourself from that liability? And that, that is something that we see from our client base. The, the printer makers, pretty well insulated thanks to the Sony line of cases, but as I mentioned, if you have the limited use printer, you're gonna get yourself a little closer to uh, walking, stepping into a, a copyright trap. So you need to know, you, you need to understand what your market is for your machine and what you're, what you're promoting it to be able to do. Uh, it's something that actually Napster itself ran into because they tried to re raise the Sony sort of there's non-infringing uses of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, but they couldn't, same thing with Rockstar, they couldn't get around the fact that how they were promoting it and instructing people to use it, it became uh, a broader purpose software uh, and network that through marketing, um, missteps, probably not because it became a really popular service, but through marketing became a kind of limited use service and that gave them problems. So you see the same thing happening with the printer makers themselves and, and then of course with the CAD file distributors too. Uh, and then, <coughs> well, you've got your EULA, which is end user license agreement for the people who haven't had to, to deal with some of this stuff before. It, it's not perfect protection to have a, a click wrap agreement that says that you agree to not use this for um, illegal purposes, but it's just another another area of protection. You can say, hey, we're, we're telling our consumers that you've got this tool, don't do something stupid with it, and, and certainly don't blame us for it. We told you not to do it. And, and that's actually what it comes down yeah. to. I mean, you know. Uh, that's the, the whole thing. When, when you look at the Napster case, you know, my reaction to that is, really? <laughs> You're going to sit there and tell me it's got non-infringing uses and that's primarily what it's for? Uh, I mean, that, takes, that takes a good trial lawyer to make that straight, with a straight face. I won't ask who in here downloaded music illegally with Grokster and Napster, but I'm betting everybody in here either did, know someone who did, or heard about someone that you won't disclose that did. <laughs> and everybody knows what those services were for. And a, a company that's really just trying to sell 
3D printers is not going to run into that unless they choose their partners uh, improperly or don't police who they're you know, putting on the box as you know, here's the, the web address to go get all of the, the 3D CAD files you want. Those are the kind of things you have to watch for. And there is some tempting desire to do that, just like for Napster. I mean, really, you want to drive up your, your user base, what do you say? You'd have to pay for this anywhere except here, and we have to have and happen to have it for free. If you're not doing that as the, the printer manufacturer, you're probably not going to have, have much trouble. I mean, it's really, really a common sense test on, on that front. And for the, the printers that are publicly accessible, there's things you can do. You, I, you see it in libraries and schools because they're allowed to do this sort of thing where they, you can put in a library a printer or just a regular photocopier, if you want to think about it that way, and allow people to make fair use copies of, of copyrighted material. But to insulate themselves, there's, it's actually part of the copyright law. You have to have a notice posted by the copier. So next time somebody, a copier, one of these institutions looks for it, that clearly lays out that don't commit copyright infringement with these photocopiers. And that helps insulate those printers for, hi for hire from uh, mm -hmm. liability for copyright infringement. Now, that code only really applies to libraries and educational institutions. So I'm not sure how broad that protection would be. But it is, again, it's like having a, a provision in the license agreement or making a statement to the customer say don't don't do something stupid with this it's it's a nice fact if you are trying or if you are in court in a couple of years for an infringement case to say hey we did what we could to distance our our services and our products from infringement uh, so, there was no inducement so have any of you tried to take a wedding photo to kinko's fedex and have a copy made or anybody that can make the you know, high quality printer photos uh, as soon as you hand over a uh, a photo of a woman in a white dress and a man in a tuxedo, uh, nine times out of ten you get met with the manager asking where it came from. Because, I mean, even if it's a personal photo, they're, they're going to ask. Um, or at least FedEx Kinko's is pretty militant about that because the copyright sits with the, the original photographer. Uh, photographer. And typically you have wedding photographers to, to deal with that. So... Um, their policies are all there, and so the 3D printing provides nothing really new. If you get a file in at Kinko's that says Spider-Man, <laughs> you, you probably want to think about that. And <laughs> as education steps up, you'll see uh, policing by the, the public institutions or the, the public businesses that are really running kind of more high-end printers than this that can produce something that might be akin to a copyrighted or trademark kids toy. Uh, but again, it's it's really going to fall down on the common sense line of things. You know when you're making money off somebody else's copyright or trademark. Uh, you said that copyright is uh, <clears throat> the main thing applicable here, but I didn't quite understand that. Are you saying that copyrighted CAD files will be the main issue because most 3D objects are patented, not copyrighted? Let, let me take that in a, in a couple places. Copyright trademark will probably be the the primary enforcement ground for for three D printers rather than patents. Um, most three D, if you're talking about a three D figurine, uh, few of them are patented. That's not the I mean, the only thing that would possibly be is a design patent. But if you're thinking about it, like a Mickey Mouse figurine that you would buy at Disney World. That's, that's either going to be trademark or copyright. It's going to be in, in those two regimes, uh, not in the design patent regime. And the utility patent regime is truly for useful objects, not... Yes, and so it would probably be more akin to, I don't, I'm not printing the whole carburetor, but if I have the the series of CAD files to print the 15 parts and put them together. And I've got a, a patented type of carburetor. Then, then you start running into to more traditional patent law or traditional inducement. Um, but you know, to date, for the typical consumer, it's more going to be in the, 
the figurine, the toys, the Lego type world. Uh, eventually, it may move into you know, more, more of those kinds of entire products like a carburetor. Uh, but before you get there, you're going to get to what Sarah was talking about, that repair reconstruction. I need a new gear for my clock. I need a new clip for my, my cable, or I need a new headband for, for my headphones. And I think as you, you step through it, you'll see those first. The, the multi-material things like carburetors cause a little bit of trouble. Got but, one more there, and then you. <laughs> so... Um, if there is any like uh, newly created 3D printed uh, work, but which has also a lot of like functional, you know, use. So how do you deal with like the merger of functionality and the aesthetic aspects? I mean, a lot of 3D like works um, are just for some practical use. So how do you deal with that? Thank you. So can you give me an example of? of what kind of products you're thinking about? Say, uh, some kind of like, uh, like what you say, a headphone or whatever, or something which is easier for you to, you know, uh, talk to the uh, earphone easier, easily, let's say. So, so maybe it's some, there's something like functional, but maybe it looks like, you know, looks beautiful. So how to deal with that, thank you. So m most of those types of things, if they fit anywhere, it would, would fit in the, the design patent world. Um, it's going to be hard to say a, a headphone uh, band would, would you know, be, I guess, covered by any kind of utility patent. Uh, but in that world, I mean, I think you're, what you're saying is there is some merger. If, if it is design patent ready, um, then fine. You've got design patents on it, and you may have copyright protection on it separately. Uh, I think one of the the common places you see, for example, design patents uh, for many years was the bottom of tennis shoes or running shoes. You know, the pattern on the bottom? The waffle. Yeah, yeah. The, the waffle on the bottom. That was uh, protected for many years with design patents, primarily to stop counterfeit goods so they could capture stuff coming in, gave them a, a tool on that. But you can see those kind of things. Uh, there's a little bit of merger in design and function there. But for the most part, that fancy bottom on most of the bottom of your running shoes is is aesthetic, not not really functional. And in terms of the distinctions between patents and copyrights, so the, the IP protections are not exclusive, and it's something that we intend to talk about is all right. So let's say that you're somebody who's come up with a, a design or a, a patentable uh, object and then how, how to deal with protections within the 3D printing world, you want to think about kind of a, a holistic IP plan to cover it. You're not going to just go get a, a design patent and then ignore copyright. You may get both. Or if there are some functional utilitarian aspects of what you're doing that are also patentable, you'll go out and seek the utility patent as well. So you can't look at these things as exclusive concepts. It's just for the, the influx of the consumer level uh, printers, the things that we're seeing right now are more on the, the function, not the functional, sorry, the design sort of side because it's hobbyists that are like, ooh, I can, I can use my uh, Connect 3D camera and scan items around my house and replicate them. It, you know, it, these things aren't necessarily patented or copyrighted. They're just playing around. It's as you go forward that you'll see things start filtering out. I mean, if you look at the Apple Samsung case, not a 3D printer issue, but you look at the patents that are in that case, they all relate to the iPhone versus the uh, Samsung Galaxy phone. You've got design patents on some features and then regular utility patents on others, and they're all in the mix together. of the, you know, some 3D work, um, but which is like, you know, is a merger of functionality, or maybe maybe more percentage of functionality, you know, than um, aesthetic, you know, the outlook, you know. So, um, how would you like 
deal with that issue of like copyrightability. Maybe it's not copyrightable. So is there any case, I, I just an idea. So I mean, that that's probably not a, a 3D printer issue. So, uh, I mean, that sets on the, the basic, is the component, before it was ever a 3D printer, you give me my headphones, is this particular piece of it copyrightable? Uh, and you know, you've, I guess before you ever get to the 3D printer portion of it, the underlying base component would have to be protectable. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's just gonna fit under, under standard, standard law. If it's just a standard clip, I'm making, you know, the, the common thing you always see is a gear. If I'm making a gear, a gear is a gear, period. Um, you know, you can't get a copyright on a gear. It's got X number of teeth, it's got X number, you know, X inch dimension. So you'll never get copyright protection on, a, on something like that. As it moves more toward the aesthetic side, it's fanciful, um, then you know, you're gonna start having more possibility on protection. But that doesn't, that's not gonna really change the 3D printer side of it. It's, Yeah, does, it's it's possible, but I mean, design patents by their very definition are not functional. Yeah, they're on the non-functional aspects of an underlying functional object, which is and sort of super helpful to the audience in understanding what that means. So, you know, <laughs> design patents, bottom of shoes, ceiling fans often have design patents on them uh, if you have different designs. So Hunter Douglas for years filed hundreds and hundreds of design patents on ceiling fans. And that way they'd, you know, I never thought about it. I thought a ceiling fan had four or five blades mm -hmm. and, and a light bulb on it. But all the different designs until they found ones that were commercially uh, successful. But they used design patents to protect. And so those are the kind of things you'll see design patents on. The reality is that the design patent litigation is you know, very, very rare. They're still expensive compared to copyright or trademark. And, and you don't have statutory damages right. in a design patent case. Copyright, you have statutory damages. There's at least a minimum recovery that you're gonna get if you win. So, so when we're advising people, design patents really, in themselves, don't really come up a lot in the discussion unless it's, I'm gonna run my Pirate Bay service and gonna hold all of these CAD files on there to make things that have design patents on them. So I can reprint the shoe bottom for you that Nike has a design patent on. But otherwise, design patents, I think the, the price point for them in this enforcement mechanism against individuals will keep them relatively unimportant compared to copyright trademark. No, the, and I don't mean to devalue design patents as a whole. It's more that design patents is related to the 3D printer industry. I don't, so far I haven't seen a, a business model where mass enforcement of design patents uh, is gonna, gonna really go forward. Uh, again, this is more of a, a Lego, Spider-Man, Disney type of, of regime right now where, where people are more concerned there.
That's that's correct. No, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think so. And let me back up again to again to my obsession with Legos or my son's obsession. With, either way, <laughs> uh, if you think about, I, I use the Batmobile as the example because that invokes all of Marvel Comics uh, trademarks and copyrights. But there would be no difficulty. You you can't advertise <laughs> DC. Sorry. You you. <laughs> so okay, I know my my Legos, but not my comic books. Uh, <laughs> The, the point being that you can't advertise them as Lego, but if they were you know, building blocks and you just made a car and you passed a CAD file for a car and where you could print each one of the, the, the blocks and then have them put together, there'd be no problem at all. Because the block is what you have to actually Correct. to frame. Correct. Or, or if I lost... <laughs> Uh, like uh, as I put them together, I, I'm pretty sure that Lego deliberately tries to take three or four blocks out of every package to frustrate me. <laughs> so I could <laughs> that or my son that, that or my son's hiding them from me to watch Dad. Uh, but w if you wanted to print four of those, that wouldn't be a problem at all. Uh, you know, they're not Lego associated. I just need this size of of block, and somebody's got a CAD file for it. Those are those are perfect. Uh, non-infringing, non-problematic uses. And I think the vast majority of, of uses are non-infringing. The problem comes with some of the more lucrative monetary examples are going to be problematic. I mean, it's the same with the music industry. There was free music out there. That's not what made Napster so popular. Uh, it, it was the, the high dollar copyright violation. I saw one more hand up, I thought. No, there we go. Okay. All right, so the how many people are familiar with the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act? A, a, a few people. So this is some another area of law that was born out of the music or, I mean, digital file transfer uh, phenomenon and that w happened in the 90s where it became, okay, this is a new way to transmit the information. It's on a can be on a much faster, larger scale now. Uh, what can be done to both protect the copyright holders and keep from having a chilling effect on the internet service provider? So you see where we're going with this is it has to do with these print file aggregators or distributors. They're going to have a similar issue that the ISPs had or still have when it comes to people posting uh, copyrighted content on their website. Uh, so you see, let's take Facebook for instance, somebody posts a copyrighted picture that they have no right to post. There was a whole series of litigation about is that, well, Facebook wasn't around back then, but is that Facebook's infringement? They are hosting copyrighted content without the permission of the copyright holder. Let's look at that in terms of these print aggregators. I think there's um, one that's called Thingiverse uh, that they people provide them with the print files, and then the result of those print files are create a would create a copy of a copyrighted product. It is that Thingiverse's fault. They're just pulling in submissions from other people and hosting it, and maybe they they get money for it, maybe they don't uh, when other people download it. Uh, so, so what are the options then? So if you're the copyright holder, you can submit a, a takedown notice and there's requirements for what that has to entail. You have to identify your copyright and then identify what is on the website that is supposedly copyrighted. Uh, and then what does the ISP do? The ISP evaluates that and if they need to, they, they, can, they determine that there is a likelihood of a copyrighted, copyrighted material up there, they pull it down, and then the ISP avoids liability if they comply with these procedures. There's things that have to be 
done, though, in order to take advantage of these safe harbor provisions of the DMCA. So there's, I can let people read it while I talk, uh, rather than, let's see. Anyway, so the, uh, the, the sorts of things that an ISP would have to do in order to take advantage of the DMCA are, are specific. It just but, to make clear, the ISP yeah. is your internet service provider, your Comcast, your Cox Cable. It, it's also the individual sites as yeah. well, uh, like, like the Facebooks of the world or in the 3D printer world, the Thingiverses of the world. Uh, you have to qualify for protection as an ISP, but then beyond that, there's a, there's a laundry list of things that you have to comply with in order to take advantage of it. Uh, the thing that is distinct, so that DMCA, when it was first enacted, it was conceiving of an idea where the copyrighted material was the thing that was being posted on an, um, a website or transferred using the ISP. The 3D printer world has a slightly different issue. It, the CAD file may be copyrighted if it's, if it's a unique piece of code, but really the main copyrighted thing that people are gonna be worried about is the end product, what you make with that uh, CAD file. So there's going to be, uh, I think, a, a look at the DMCA and how far it can stretch to see if it really does indeed cover the, the, the aggregators of these CAD files that if, if they do all of these things that are required in the DMCA, somebody sends a takedown notice and they take it down, are they okay? Or does the DMCA actually not quite extend to them? And there may have to be legislation, frankly, that would confirm that this sort of thing is covered. But as it stands right now, you're seeing reports um, that everyone, copyright holders and the ISPs alike, are treating these CAD files as though they're fair game under the DMCA for these sorts of provisions. So you're seeing the takedown notices and then the, pay, the ISPs taking advantage of the safe harbor. And I think part of that's two reasons. One, this group of aggregators is better educated there's, a, I guess, maybe that's not fair. There's a better body of law on what's acceptable and not not acceptable, so they're trying to walk a line on the legal side uh, that nobody knew about back in the Napster days. And number two, as, as often is out there, there's not a lot of money to be made just yet. Uh, I can only print in one color. Uh, I can't actually duplicate the Disney figurines with the same precision, I can buy them at the Disney store. And there's not uh, you know, a significant reduction in price. So you know, this is the cynical litigator in me. I'd like to think that people are acting better than they were 20 years ago with regard to intellectual property rights. Uh, then I think about it for a minute and understand, no, they're not. There's just not enough money to encourage people to act badly yet. And they'll get there. But it, this market may develop slowly enough uh, versus the digital music market that you won't see quite as much litigation on that front. Plus, now, when you receive a takedown notice from Disney, most people do it. Uh, if it's legitimate, which they typically are, you know what's coming next, and you know that copyright holders, trademark holders uh, are, are enforcing their rights because they have a duty to police. So you see a little bit better action right now. What will be interesting is when there's money in it and everything moves offshore. Uh, Pirate Bay is, is the perfect example of that. What happens there? Yeah, yeah, and that will help drive the, the cost of making these copies or counterfeit items as well. Wayne just touched on it. If you get a plastic Mickey Mouse figurine from Disney, even at Disney prices, you know, 20, 30 bucks if, if you're at the theme park, I think. You know, the, the, there's a, pre, a theme park premium, I, in my experience. That's still substantially less expensive than going out, buying a printer, getting access to a printer, creating the CAD file or buying the CAD file from someone else, and then getting the rest of the materials to and spending the time to print it out. There's a, a cost benefit uh, analysis that's kind of creating a, a stand down a little bit on some of this stuff, but uh, 3D printers have been around for a long time, and when you, the 
but now that they're moving into consumer space, you're going to see consumers that are help driving the innovation, creating more of the CAD files, pushing, helping push through some of the um, improvements on the technology that make the existing 3D printers faster, more precise, and, and worth doing these things, these sorts of counterfeit goods offshore in particular. So that, that covers liability risks, and we've talked a little bit about if you're the right holder. Oh, okay. So I, I, I want to address something you said uh, earlier. Uh, you said the, the agencies that you find who've gone up not so much because of the law as the fact that they're out there, but because of technology involved and because they have a Spotify and Netflix and Hulu and you know, cooperating to help guide these things out, uh, you, you know, it's certain, certain companies that are highly gated, yeah. it's like if I have some kind of inheritor and say, go and close up one of those supplies and have everybody use it, you pay, you pay like uh, $10 extra dollars to buy the product and you download the file and That's exactly right, and, and and also the bottom line is that IP protection's flawed because it, you can't guarantee that you're covering everything, and you can't cover it forever either. So you saw the same thing, like you said, with uh, Netflix, that sort of thing. But even with the music industry, after a while, the music industry got wise and came up with better ways of distributing the legitimate, full quality audio, th whether it's through iTunes or Amazon, and you get take advantage of the consumer confidence in a legitimate product, you create a revenue stream. People want to go to you because you know that there's services if the download doesn't work right, whatever it is, so sometimes that that's the best way to protect yourself as a rights holder is figuring out a way to, to get in on it rather than just going and suing people. There may be more money in actually just providing the service yourself with your own license. Though the, the first thing the music industry had to do was get the needle off zero. Yeah. Because with, with Napster, the price to buy a song was zero. And it's hard to compete against that model. Um, so they had to move it up a little bit. And then with the introduction of iTunes, the 99 cent, uh, again, dating myself, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that did change the model. And so as we're talking about protecting the right holders, very much the, the goal is to, to get ahead of it and use a lot of the regime that's already been put in place. Again, we have a lot more law now than we did before. When, when Napster originally started, it was not clearly wrong. And so zero was, was a great place for them to start. There was really no indication that what they were doing was wrong um, until the Supreme Court came down and, and said, it's absolutely wrong. And you should have known about it four years ago, and here's your fine. So uh, I think you're, you're exactly right. There's a better model for people to follow. And I think the Netflixes and Hulus of the world benefited from the growing pains that the music industry went through. And, and also the education of the consumer. I, I, I remember... <laughs> I don't know what the statute of limitations on peer-to-peer -peer file sharing is, but I'm, I'm hoping that it's expired now since I was in an undergrad a really, really long time ago. But when I wasn't thinking I was going to be an IP attorney then either, so that's that's my defense. Um, <laughs> but when years later all of the Napster litigation started and they started coming after the individual downloaders, I know that that is that and also studying and working in IP law, that has certainly molded my view of how I deal with videos. I'm, I'm not going to go download a movie that's in the movie theater right now because it's pretty obvious that that's going to be copyright infringement. And you know that there's at least some people out there who are willing to enforce it against the end user. It's also Especially it's if also the end criminal. user's a yeah. IP lawyer. Yeah, there's really no plausible deniability anymore. So. <laughs> Anyway, that, that's a good segue to you know, moving from what's the risk of the user and the people taking advantage of the uh, industry for liability to what you have to do if you're a rights holder to protect yourself um, better. We've got on one side just jumping into the game. So if you're Lego, maybe a Lego branded uh, printer or 
distribute your own Lego building blocks files uh, and and instructions to create a presumably licensed Batmobile with it and take advantage of the consumer confidence and um, or if you're like me I would sometimes it's nice just to have Lego printed on stuff then you know you got the real deal but get involved in that industry work with the printer manufacturers to get involved and and make your money that way rather than through enforcement but that's not an option for every company so you do have to look to the IP world for you know what's my best offense plan yeah, and, and often these break down into two groups, you know, one being the the Disneys of the world, uh, the Legos of the world. Well, so they, those actually don't match up. The Disneys of the world that own a recognizable brand, uh, the Legos that actually help build. You could build a, a Spider-Man toy or a Batmobile. And then the further end of the spectrum is, are, you know, the individual artists, uh, those that are making sculptures that are then being replicated. So you've got to you know, across that spectrum and often materials themselves, like the material required to replicate, uh, makes makes the decision, the discussion nothing more than academic. Um, I promise you that probably in my lifetime, I will not use a 3D printer to print my wife's Valentine's Day jewelry presents. <laughs> uh, if, you know, so, I mean, <laughs> just think about that for a minute for any of those that, that might be considering that, what kind of reaction you'd get. Uh, there's some natural boundaries about what are going to be protectable or not, and it's really going to gravitate toward the, really toward the trademark things and people, the things that you're going to recognize. So if you're a, a company out there that has come up with, I, I'm focusing more on the end products again rather than the machines themselves, because there's a whole host of issues there, but if you've got a, a design that maybe has some functional elements, maybe has some decorative elements, you gotta walk through a checklist of, okay, what, one, what can I afford? Because that's gonna definitely dictate some of behavior uh, to your point earlier that copyrights are essentially free. I mean, you have to pay to register them, but versus a patent where you're, there's a, a pretty substantial application fee plus all the attorney's fees for the two years on the electrical component, mechanical side, or many, many years on the biotech side, you know, what, what can I afford? So you go through and say, what are, what are my options? There's what we talked about today. Maybe there is a utility patent option. And in terms of the patent world, that tends to be where the money is when you go to enforce. But maybe the design patents where you can go because it is inexpensive and it scares people because to them, all they hear is patent. Uh, then Trademarks and copyrights, tremendous amount of overlap there is what we talked about for things like Legos with the, the Lego characters themselves or the things that you can build with them. How do you want to go after protecting that angle of things? And then uh, you got your copied and counterfeit goods. And if you're in an industry where there is going to be competition for that sort of thing, that also is going to dictate your IP strategy. So one of the, the scenarios that we've seen uh, discussed is cases, cell phone cases. And it's always a, a tr real problem for some of the cell phone case manufacturers to keep up with the changes. Uh, the cell phone companies aren't forthcoming with exact dimensions, so you'll notice a lag time. Or where the power port's right. gonna be on the next version of the iPhone. <laughs> and so this is, that's an area when you think about in terms of if they come in seeking advice, this is what we want to do. We want to make the <laughs> CAD files for you know, because we, we can have them out 24 hours after we get the first phone in our hands, and we want to make them configurable. Well, there's nothing really special about most of the, the cell phone cases. I mean, they, they come in a couple different colors, different materials, uh, and a few different configurations, but so they're not going to be really patent protectable. But if I'm putting out that file, I, I spend the time to make that file, and that's my business. I sell it to people that have the 3D printers. How do you protect that business model? So if that's your client, they walk in the door, what do you offer them as protection? And that's kind of what we struggle with. It's, and this is where I think you start seeing 3D printing present a little bit different regime than before. 
most things before would fit nicely into one or two, but now it's kind of everything is on the table for, for 3D printing. Because in that particular instance, what am I selling? I mean, what do you buy from me? You buy a CAD file, zeros and ones. Now, I designed it. It's all new and original, so I'm not just taking a picture of somebody else's design. So I've got copyright protection in my code. So that, in that particular instance, is, is going to go that way. But what if I'm doing something a little bit more with my cases? I've got something special to put in. Do I then have a design patent also? Very, very likely. Trademark? No. Unless I've got the license from Disney. Now, if I've licensed something from Disney where I can etch the Mickey Mouse into my case, now I've got a whole trademark issue and I've got to have all of the, the license agreements. So as we kind of talk through this a little bit, think about those kind of people, the folks that would actually be making a business out of 3D printers, what they'd be selling, and then who would then be knocking that off. Because again, once that digital file's out there, it's easy for somebody else to just offer it for half price. And within that too, I think the the circum the anti circumvention technology. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out going forward. Because with music and and video files, you can put digital watermarks in the actual file. Because again, that music file or the picture or the video is the copyrighted thing but when you've got the cad file is what's posted on a, a website for other people to download it's really the end product maybe that's protected by the copyright or the trademark but how do you watermark or put some sort of anti-circumvention technology in something that doesn't exist yet uh, so it'll be interesting to see how people start, and it, it'll probably happen at the code level first in these CAD files of embedding certain um, certain codes or identifiers that when it's downloaded, it, there's a record of it somewhere. I mean, you can see where they would go to try to stop that, but once it becomes used and that end product is out there, how do you track a physical object that's no longer connected to the Internet in any way? So one of the changes is... I didn't see anybody wearing them, and it's a very good thing. But if you remember Crocs, I won't, I won't ask who owns a pair of Crocs. Um, They're very comfortable. They never look good, never look good with suits. Uh, but if you remember Crocs, do you remember something called gibbets? They were the little buttons you. Like charms for, right? Yeah, I, I put I'm them. I'm now showing too much knowledge of this area. I put them in the, the category of trinkets, but they yeah. were the little things that snapped into the holes in the Crocs, and it have a. Uh, well, it could be a Mickey Mouse or a flower or a happy face. Anybody remember those? Well, those. <laughs> to your credit. <laughs> I, I, I like the people that put their heads down and shake their heads no, but they know they know them. Yeah. They have. Them. So if you, uh, let's put it this way. It was, uh, you know, uh, close to a $100 million business, which stuns me, uh, <laughs> that those little things that would snap in the shoes. But all they were was basically a plastic, plastic design that would snap into the holes in those shoes. It's like an earring, uh, except for the holes in the top of Crocs. And with those, when we were defending that company, the biggest thing we'd do was copyright and seizures of counterfeits coming in. Uh, tells you a lot. I mean, there were massive containers coming in with with just knockoff gibbets. <laughs> I, I don't understand it. Um, <laughs> So I've done two seizures in my life. One was that. The other was zigzag paper. And <laughs> I, I didn't quite understand that at the time. Now living in Colorado, I do. So, yeah. <laughs> um, But th with those, that entire business model looks a little bit, little bit more disrupted because before the counterfeits came in in mass, now the counterfeits come from everywhere, from, from, everywhere, from anybody that's, that's got a 3D printer. So how do you advise a, a company like that? And then more importantly, if that kind of company has a license, so they have the license to do the superheroes or the Disney, does that change the nature of the arrangement between you know, my client and Disney? Who's got that obligation to police? Before, you know, Disney might have been a little more interested because they were seizing you know, a container load at a time. 